Welcome to the SMB Community Podcast with your hosts, Amy Babinchek, James Kernan, Amy Luby, and Carl Palachuk. Produced by and for the Small Biz Thoughts technology community. We're dedicated to making every IT professional a successful IT professional. Hi, this is Carl. Welcome to another SMB Community Podcast. I'm joined today by Amy and James. Welcome, welcome. Hello, hello. So hello. Amy's having all the fun today. So in one once a year, she gets to make this special trek. She drive, gets in her car and drives north for three and a half hours and arrives at the boat. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> that is not a once a year activity. That is a every week activity from well, May to October. <laughs> but, there's, but there's one day when you when you first go to the boat after it has been put in the water after the ice has melted in Michigan. Uh, this is true. This is actually so the boat went in the water last week, and that was that's a big ordeal. I get terrified when the boat is up in the slings and like my afraid like you know dropping an egg on the ground and just worried that something bad's going to happen it it never does but it always makes me nervous and then um yeah so last week was lots of work of you know washing it and putting the sails up and getting all the all the things together and so this week will be more more leisurely will you be sailing I hope to. I hope we'll get out there at the at the club this week we have our annual meeting and stuff there's a lot going on but i'm expecting we'll get out into the lake i do have to say i love your philosophy that if your folks have got all their clients in order uh that they can take fridays off in the summer because uh you want to go to your boat in the summer and so <laughs> you've taken care of your business and if they take care of their business they can do the same no i see yeah we call it summer fridays and um, although some of my staff Mondays, um, and it runs from Memorial Day to Labor Day, and uh, yes, it, you're not allowed to tell the clients that you're not working that day, and we don't put on out of office messages. But if everything is taken care of, and you know, definitely don't schedule any meetings for that day. Um, you know, it will be quiet, and you can go off and enjoy some of our very uh, precious summer months. That is a, that's a requirement in the Midwest, right? You got to enjoy all the seasons, but especially the summer. Carl, I'm surprised you didn't fly up for the christening of the boat going in. I, I can visualize you with your yellow tie on smashing a bottle of champagne off the front of the boat each, each season. Because oh. it is a big deal. It's a big deal when you when you uh, drop the boat in the water again. I think if I smashed a champagne bottle against the side of the boat, Missy would strangle me with the rope. <laughs> <laughs> Scratch yeah. my I'm now going to kill you. True. True. <laughs> so I, Carl doesn't venture into Michigan unless it's July or August. Yeah. I, I'm real, real into the nice weather, which is why, you know, you could live somewhere else and then you, you don't have to, you know, keep your happiness into this tall, this uh, small little uh, piece of the year. So, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, but the Great Lakes are where the Great Lakes are. So they are reason enough to be here. This podcast is sponsored by the Small Biz Thoughts technology community. Check us out at smallbizthoughts.org. Forms, templates, and checklists are just the start. Our community includes all of the best-selling books on managed services in all available formats, plus free training, members-only programs, and the best business training available to managed service providers anywhere. Plus, we have weekly live members-only Zoom calls. The average member saves more than 200% of their membership cost each year. We are totally dedicated to your success. Just because you're in business for yourself doesn't mean you have to go it alone. Join us today at smallbizthoughts.org. It's time for five minutes with somebody smart. All right, so this is Carl, and I am I have five minutes with a smart person, and the smart person 
is normally one of the co-hosts, and it's Mr. James Kernan. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored to be listed in that category. <laughs> well, this is your last time, so, you know, don't get used to it. Um, oh. <laughs> so I wanted to talk to you about the class that you teach over at IT Service Provider University called Leadership and Management Principles for MSPs. So first of all, give us the overview. Like, what is this five-unit class all about? Obviously, leadership. So, Yeah. So, so just big picture, if I could, Carl, let me step back. You know, I love to teach. Um, I love to share things that I've learned. And a lot of the teachings, I've done professional sales uh, training classes in in multiple communities, uh, including yours, and I've done lots of uh, marketing and lead gen. That's all fun because that's about business growth. I'm really, really excited about this one. And a lot of the material I have, I actually was approached a few years ago from the Office of Personnel Management, the federal government, and they wanted to put together a, a career advancement training program for federal employees all around the country. And uh, I wrote a five-part program and rolled that out. And actually, that first year that we rolled that out, we, we won a, a National Innovation Award uh, from the Office of Personal Management. So I was really honored. It's leadership and management is kind of the lost and forgotten skill set in, I'd say, in many industries, but specifically in, in the MSP, in, our, in the channel. So uh, fundamentally... What most business owners should be doing is working on their business, not in their business. They need to learn how to delegate more, still hit their goals and grow, but then themselves do less work, right? So a lot of us don't get that. You know, I certainly didn't get that being that Midwestern work ethic young man in the industry. I thought in order to get ahead, I just had to work harder and we need to work smarter and the leadership and management principles course really walks through uh, a lot of those tips and techniques. You know, it's a five-part class that um, you know that that really uh, I think does a great job. And it's not just for business owners, Carl. I think this is for any any really any employee in in your team. Uh, you, your job is to uh, uh, you know make them better, make the employees better. And I'm a big believer in your community and what you're offering in, in these classes. And this, to me, would be a, a, a must take. Very cool. And so it was live a few months ago, but now it's it's uh, on demand. But um, really great stuff. So I like the fact that you you sort of set some standards and you say, look, you can be an exceptional leader. It's, you know, there's nothing in the size of your business that limits your ability to be excellent or to provide good guidance or to build culture. Um, most companies are small, so you don't have to have, uh, you know, whatever, 50 or 100 employees in order to focus on leadership. Um, even if you have one employee, a little bit of leadership goes a long ways. Yeah, ab absolutely. It just starts with one. And, you know, fundamentally, we dig into, you know, how, and again, you don't have to have this dynamic personality to be a successful leader face it, most, most of us in this industry are, are introverts, right? Highly technical. It's, it's sometimes awkward having a one-on-one -on -one conversation or one-to-many conversation. So we kind of talk about that. But, you know, session one was more about the exceptional leadership. That's a really good leadership uh, fundamental course. Uh, two was leading teams, you know, so how to motivate and connect your team to the vision and um, and lead the teams and keep them motivated, inspired. Uh, three is really around recruiting and building the team, uh, comp plans and, and how to communicate with them. Uh, four is really all about culture. And culture is such a broad, overused term, but we really drill deep into creating your own unique culture. Uh, it's not what everybody tells you you need. It's what you, uh, it's more of your personality. And then, uh, and then to me, the final one was all about inspiration and motivation, and it's called gamification. It's making work fun. So employees, you know, jump out of bed Monday morning at six o'clock and rush to work, right? Wouldn't that be great to have that? 
it, it can be done. So, uh, yeah, and, and I love it that, you know, the fact that uh, there's so much emphasis on that you can actually do this and you have a very, uh, I, I really like your style, you know, the fact that you're like, hey, there just is a right way to do certain things. Many people, I think, get into business and uh, and many other things in life where four or five years down the road, they say, man, I wish somebody had given me uh, this information when I first started. Well, this is the information mm -hmm. you were looking for when you first started. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's a, it's a great class. So I'm happy to, happy to share. Very good. So that's over at itspu.com and it's leadership and management principles for MSPs. Check it out. Hey. All righty. Uh, Question of the day, IT question of the day, do you have to be an early adopter if you're an IT consultant? Great question, great question. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll chime in and, and say no, uh, because if that was the case, everybody would be running patches, you know, right out of the get-go, right? Isn't it? industry best practice to uh, maybe wait a rev behind uh, and make sure everything works. Um, uh, and I, and normally I would say I like being aggressive and being out front, you know, that's the competitive side of me in, in business, but uh, I don't think you need to be an early adopter, you know, to be successful. Absolutely. Well, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. People wait on patches as much as they used to. It's been a long time since a patch took down a, a server. Yeah. But yeah, people do yeah. still wait. People do still wait. And they do it because it's the way they've always done it. So I feel like this question, uh, Carl baited us, you know, to be opposites here. Because I feel that if you're in IT and you are not living on the bleeding edge, then you're doing your clients a disservice. Right. It's our job to know everything that's going on out there, what's new, what's coming, what the problems are, what the advantages are. And mm -hmm. if, if we're not out there living on the bleeding edge, um, by the time we by the time we have ourselves rolled back a version or not keeping up and then our clients are back behind us even farther, we're you know, that pushes their technology movement even further yep. even further behind so I, think, I, I, think, I like i like to keep my staff on the bleeding edge and i drive them absolutely crazy by implementing every new thing that comes along and say let's try it out and kick its tires and see what it does and yeah and uh you know make sure we know it i think amy said something important i think you need to know about the leading edge right because i think it's our responsibility as consultants and leaders in the marketplace to educate our customers and our teams about what's coming, I just professionally or respectfully uh, uh, would say that, you know, but you don't have to be doing it all. You have to know about it. We need to educate ourselves so we can share that knowledge. I don't know if you have to do it all and be seen as being that leading edge, bleeding edge uh, partner uh, to be successful. So you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm thrown back to the days when people refused to install Vista because they refused to <laughs> rule about only using new hardware when you have a new operating system. And so they had problems with Vista. And so I know a lot of IT consultants that they, they skipped the whole Vista era and then Windows 7 came out and they're like, oh my God, I, I love this feature and this feature and this feature. And like, okay, you could have been using those for several years if you had just yeah. adopted Vista, which was, you know, uh, just one of those things where they, whatever, for whatever reason, they didn't, they wanted to go slow. So I think there's a lot of go slow people. I do agree with you, James, you should be at least aware of it. But on certain things, I think you should be on the cutting edge in terms of if you're not using the latest hardware and, and software, you cannot give your clients good advice. Right. I mean, you, yeah. you literally have to dig into like, this is the latest thing. So don't use old stuff. And if you want your clients to buy new stuff, well, you can't be using old stuff. <laughs> and, the, and this is an interesting, this is an interesting question uh, that fascinates me. But I often run into times, especially when I'm working with a new client, we'll dig into the finances and 
I had, uh, won't name names, but there might have been a client of mine that, you know, goes to every trade show known to mankind, and they buy something every single time. They buy all the latest and greatest tools, but they don't have time to implement them and to strategize about how they're going to do it. So that's another thing I see when you're chasing after the the shiny objects, uh, you know, their, their P&L is ugly because they, they buy all these tools they, they don't implement. Um, so that's another part of me being a little bit more conservative uh, because it, it can adversely affect your numbers, you know, in profitability if you, if you don't plan it out and, and use it properly yourselves. So another yeah, thought. Well, on. I think we're maybe talking about two different aspects of this question because what you just described is chasing this shiny object around of, oh, this tool does something, you know, a micrometer better than the old tool did. So I'm going to, I'm going to go out and buy that thing. That just ends up with chaos inside your business. What exactly. I was really talking about is new, the new version of office, the new version of windows, the latest features of QuickBooks, the, you know, how to use one note, how, you know, the, the, tools of the trade for, you know, security features with multi-factor authentication, um, you know, just keeping up with all of this stuff that your clients are going to be using. Mm -hmm. To me, that's the, that's the more important thing that we have to try to stay a, ahead of them on so that yeah, we can I, give them good advice when they need it. Exactly. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Agree with that. So uh, it's funny. Um, I am slow to adopt major things in my business, right? Like the platform that I use to, to process credit cards. You know, when something's been working for five years or so, uh, <laughs> I will I will tiptoe into a new process. But, uh, you know, you, you have to be careful sometimes in business. So we have to understand our clients do the same thing. Like, oh, this this works to a point, you know, tell me why I should make the change. But I've also had clients who uh, I show them a feature for something, you know, they're like trying to figure out how to share calendars or whatever. And I remember one client specifically was like, if you had shown me this before, I would have switched three years ago. <laughs> I'm like, OK, well, uh, you could just pay attention to my newsletter if you wanted. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yep. Happens all the time. Yeah. So anyway, so it's it's a balance. If if you have a different opinion, why don't you go to the SMB Community Podcast.com website and click the button and uh record a little bit of an audio and we'll we'll put you on the show with uh, with your opinion and and your point of view. So Amy's got a fun news item that I, I think uh would be happy to chat about. Yeah, so I I read an article. Uh, was one that LinkedIn was promoting, and uh, it said that Twitter owes both Google and AWS huge amounts of money for essentially hosting them in their environments. Google apparently manages security, and AWS hosts the service, and um, they have not paid. So. They're the they're the they're the deadbeat client for Google and AWS, and the number for AWS alone was well over seventy million. And they didn't disclose what the number was from Google, but I gathered it was also very large. Mm -hmm. um, and so this made me think about you know this is a problem that all IT service providers have. When do you cut off the deadbeat client, and when is Google and AWS going to cut off their deadbeat client or or are they you know when your deadbeat client is twitter they have to i guess worry about the the social implications of you killed twitter yeah. you know? <laughs> the backlash yeah exactly and and what's yeah. it for killing twitter right i mean so that's actually for both of them the competition right uh, it seems like you know if they if they Twitter has never had a legitimate business model, literally not for one minute in the history of their existence. And so, you know, if they if they die, they die. Uh, and, and Google would be better off and Amazon will be better off. So I, I don't think it's a horrible thing. So, yeah, that that uh, that's, that's an interesting topic, though. When do you cut off 
the non-paying client. You know, a lot of a lot of MSPs have in their agreement, you know, 10 days without payment. They, you know, may turn off their, you know, that's that's the fastest way to get a phone call from a client who owes you money is turn off their email, right? Uh, might not be the right way, but it's the fastest way. But when would you when would you cut them off? Go ahead. Yeah, this is a this is a question that is you know it's it's very relevant um, and very analogous to what the decision that Google and AWS are having to make. Yeah. Because we do sort of with everything in the cloud now, we do have their business in our hands, right? So we're not just saying, oh, we're not going to come over to your office and fix your computers anymore because you owe us money. It's, yeah, we're going to, you know, you didn't pay us, so now you don't have access to any of your data or email, um, which essentially shuts the business down these days. The stakes, the stakes are high. This is a huge uh, thing for me. I, for literally for at least 15 years, I've been telling people, A, get paid in advance for absolutely everything, and B, have a very strict policy on collections if you don't get paid in advance for everything. Because what happens is that people, they, you know, they let people get more and more and more in debt. And then eventually they're afraid to talk to them about it. And then they're afraid to collect the money. And I have literally had people say to me, you know, oh, you know, this is my best client. I can't have that difficult conversation. And I look at them and I'm like, your best client owes you 30, 40, 50. And in, in one case, I am not exaggerating, $70,000, right? Yeah. And I said, if that's your best client, who's your worst client, right? You, and then what happens is to collect that money, you give them a massive discount. So you've got your best, your actual best clients are paying full price. And the people who are using you like a bank uh, are getting a massive discount, sometimes 20, 30%. You're losing money on that client um, mm -hmm. considered to be your best client. This just is completely unacceptable. And it's preventable by having a written policy that says, if you're whatever, X number of dollars uh, in arrears, you get a letter and then you get a phone call and then we cut off your service. And it's just yeah. got to happen because otherwise you could go you could literally go bankrupt because you didn't collect money that was legitimately owed to you. Yeah. I love having the policy of, you know, prepay, you know, automate that payment. We're all technology companies, right? We're supposed to bring technology efficiencies and automation to our customers with the, um, you know, with the, the idea of, of saving both parties money by streamlining those processes. That's how I would always explain it. But uh, it's important, I think, to remove the leverage of letting, you know, good people do bad things, you know, or good clients become bad clients to what Carl just said, you know, automate that payment up front to remove that, uh, you know, one, the, the temptation of not paying. But yeah, I, I work with a lot of clients, you guys that uh, have done that, where they'll extend credit and they become the bank. And I've always said that... Um, <clears throat> Customers pay late because you let them, yep. you know, have policies in, play, in place that don't let them do that, you know, so that's important. All the way from, you know, the lawyer down the street to Google and Amazon, we, we all, turns out we all have the same problems. Yeah. 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 Well, and how do you, if you're, let's say you're Google and you, you go to your board of directors, how do you tell them these guys owe, owe us millions of dollars? They have literally said, we will not pay you. Um, maybe this is a ploy by Elon Musk to just get out of the business by having those people, uh, you know, take ownership and, and shut them down or something. I don't know. Because hmm. when you tell people we're not going to pay you, why would they continue to, you know, give them extra services? What's right. what's the leverage there, except that they think that they might own a piece of that company someday or all of it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I I don't know what strategy is. So I, we're Twitter. We can do whatever we want to do, I guess. So, well, I, I will say just as a side note, if anybody will let me go 
uh, $70 billion in, uh, or $70 million in arrears, um, I, I will find a way to spend that money. So, <laughs> and I can't promise you'll get it back. <laughs> That, that anyway, side that's a side note. So um events. Uh Mr. Kernan, you have something coming up at the end of June. Tell us about it. Yes, yes. I'm super excited. I've got some fantastic things lined up. The uh, Mastermind Live event in Denver is June 29th and 30th. Um it's in the downtown Denver area. And one of the things, you know, there, there's so many competing events out there. It's like, well, why would you want to come to this one? I like creating more of an experience. Not only is it, you know, educational where you're going to meet, you know, super smart people, learn lots of cool things about your business and technology wise, but it's also a fun experience in Denver. You know, we're doing some some fun things uh, the evenings. Um, we're going out to the uh, the fireworks finale at Coors Field uh, for the Colorado Rockies and Detroit Tigers game uh, Friday night. Um, but we've got some really cool speakers lined up as well on security, on um, EOS, uh, leadership, sales, marketing. So that, uh, that'll that be a fun event. I'm looking forward to that. That's just a, a couple weeks out. Cool. And uh, I'm going to be at ChannelCon, uh, CompTIA's ChannelCon, August 1, 2, 3. And um, my employees are coming with me. So Kara and Jen are both going to be there. Uh, last year, it was easy because they were they live in Michigan, so they just sort of scooted around the lake to Chicago. Uh, this year, they they're going to fly to Vegas, and uh, and then I I also have a special guest who will be in my booth that I can't announce yet because uh, I haven't signed the deal. But uh, uh, our booth will be the place to be in Las Vegas. So, uh, and I and I've got a link to to get you into ChannelCon for free. So. Uh, if you don't have twelve hundred dollars burning all in your pocket, you can get in for free with the link that's in the show notes. Amy, what's up with you? Uh, well, I'm planning to go to Channel Con as well, so I will see you out there, and I can't wait to see your booth. But um, other than that, that's what I'm going to do. The uh, James, your event is great. I've been to it before. I love it because it's small. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, as we as we're recording this right now, uh, Pax Eight is having their conference, and I think there's about 1,200 people out there. And I went to a conference with 1,200 people earlier this year, and uh, more than 1,200, really. Um, in that kind of environment, it's hard to build new relationships, I find. I, I always seem to do better at the, at the smaller events, and you'll get more time with each of the vendors. You'll get more time with your fellow attendees, really get to know some people. And I think that's a huge advantage of small events. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point. We design them like that on purpose. And that and you know, trust me, if we had twelve hundred attendees, I, I wouldn't be taking everybody to the ballpark. So uh <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. Unless, unless Carl and I got 70 million. Yeah, well, unless have. you get a $70 million line of credit, well, then you're good. <laughs> so, I'm gonna start planning all the things I could do with a line of credit like that. Um so, so final little announcement, we have a, an amazing webinar coming up for the, at the uh, National Society of IT Service Providers. So if you're a National Society member, uh, go to nsitsp.org, click on events and uh, sign up for the webinar on change management, which is coming up on June 28th. And that's with Larry Mandelberg, one of the board members uh, and uh, so anyway, that's that'll be a cool thing. Again, it's one of those things where uh, NSITSP has somehow managed to uh, do some events that are topics that we just don't see in our industry. And uh, that doesn't mean they're not worthwhile. It's just that uh, we haven't uh, we haven't had them yet. So now we do. You know what? This topic actually dovetails into what we first were discussing, and that is, you know, living on the bleeding edge or hanging back because this webinar is really all about how you adopt the culture of change within your business and then how you extend that out to your clients. And we all have those clients sometimes that are stick in the mud. And so how do we how do we get our staff on, on board with accepting and 
readily and eagerly adopting change, and then how do we push that, you know, along with our clients so that they're moving along with this with the technology as well. I hear it so many times, or you know, if you follow any of the groups out there, people are you know still supporting Windows 10, Windows 7, and their client won't upgrade, and they're working on that 2008 server, and it's like. <laughs> there's, there's an argument to be said that's a culture problem in addition to, you know, maybe somebody's just really cheap, but it's also a culture problem. They're not seeing the value of change, the advantage of change. <laughs> right. going to be about. Well, you know, it's interesting. This is one of those areas where small businesses actually have an advantage if they take the advantage over larger businesses. When I was at HP, this was many, many years ago, so 30 years ago at HP, um, they had, you know, roughly 100,000 employees. And so they had a thing called the Common Operating Environment. And they listed out the, the software that you could download, and it was on a server, and there was a certain place. You couldn't install anything, absolutely anything for 100,000 employees that was not on that list. And it's because they can't manage having 52 operating systems and, you know, uh, 80 different applications on your desktop and so forth and so on. And so they were very, very slow to adopt, which meant that they were always at least one or two and sometimes four or five uh, generations behind in software, where a small company, you have 10 employees, you could just say, look, we're just moving to the next thing, period, have a nice day. So, uh, you know, let your clients know that that's an advantage for them in many ways. Amy, enjoy the boat. James, enjoy uh, Colorado. And uh, and I'm going to head off to Vegas for the weekend because I can. <laughs> have a great have a great time. We'll see you guys yeah. next week. See if they All get right, we'll see a million dollar line of credit. Thanks for tuning in to the SMB Community Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to the SMB Community Podcast. If you found this useful, interesting, or fun, please subscribe, share with your friends, and give us a thumbs up on your favorite social media. Please check out the show notes at smbcommunitypodcast.com and give us your feedback.